it's, I'm very happy and honored to um, welcome uh, Professor Gary Grunkemeyer for this, uh, this session. I prepared a few slides. So the easiest thing I could find on Gary is in a, a research gate. I don't know whether you really maintain that, but I, you see that your disciplines are statistics, cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology, and the number, number of uh, skills are listed there. Um, my introduction is in line with what Alan Fraser was saying. Uh, supposedly are both a cardiac surgeon and a researcher, a significant contribution to the development of objective performance criteria, this OPC, that's the central topic of today. And your work has uh, helped to establish a framework for evaluating clinical performance of prosthetic heart valves, leading to improved patient outcomes. And I think that's really nice that it, it makes that claim that you really made, made a difference in that respect. Uh, I will be honest, I also used, uh, I used a chat GPT to make uh, this introduction, and this is the original uh, text, and uh, I was actually struck by the second uh, uh, statement, received his medical degree from University of Nebraska in 1965, that is before I was born, so you can deny that if you like, and don't know whether it is true, that's always a, a difficulty with these kinds of uh, AI developments, and that relates to, to what we are talking about today. How can we know that a valve is safe and effective? Uh, and one of the papers that I read yesterday that you wrote about that already in 2006 is really very nice and accessible, and that's on a topic that, that I was wondering about, about this comparison between OPC as a way to address safety issues and effectiveness of trials, First randomized clinical trial. I really love this paper. It's nearly 20 years old. It's very accessible, very readable. And I also want to, to highlight that we have a common uh, past. We did uh, four papers together in the, already 20 years ago again. Uh, 2001 was the first with uh, people at Erasmus. Um, and so I'm very, very happy that you will continue talking about this issue of how do we know what the safety and effectiveness of uh, these valves is. So the floor is yours. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Eva, for the kind introduction. Uh, I also used chat GPT to look up your name and I got it about two paragraphs a very impressive information, almost all of which I knew to be true, since I'm pretty familiar with you and your work. Then I tried that on myself, chat GPT, and I got about five paragraphs, 90% of which were completely wrong. Now, I don't know why that is, because I've used chat GPT on other things, and it's pretty accurate. Um, I'm not a physician, I'm just a lowly statistician. And, um, but thank you for the introduction. Now, how do I share my screen now? Yes, please. Okay. And thank you, Alan, for the uh, opportunity to participate in this webinar. Let's see here. So OBC, is a pretty simple concept, really. It's just a number by which uh, the regulatory bodies can evaluate the performance of a new heart valve before uh, accepting it. So it's a long story. I'm just going to tell the history of OPCs, how they came about. Uh, that was the first word in the title that was assigned to me, the origins. They were actually first published in a heart valve guidance from the FDA in 1994. And they were updated about 20 years later by the ISO, a task force of the ISO. But as I looked at the origins of this and kind of went backwards in time, I realized the story really began a lot earlier than those dates. I claim that Albert Starr, who did the first successful heart valve in 1960, actually was the origin of the concept and that his work directly flows in to the OPC as we know them today. And I hope to establish that 
during this presentation. So in 1960, Albert Starr co-invented with Lowell Edwards the cage ball heart valve and installed it in a person. He's, he began by implanting these cage ball valves in the mitral valve position of a whole bunch of dogs. And then he thought, when should I switch to man? And this is a slide that Albert himself uses when he talks about the early days, how different things were. There was no FDA, FDA. there was no uh, approval needed. It was just up to him. So one day the chief of cardiology came down to the kennel that was full of these Labradors with heart valves and running around, and one of them licked his hand. And that was the, that was the turning point. When they had their discussions between the surgeons and the cardiologists in their smoke-filled rooms, the cardiologists urged them to please use your valve in my patients who are dying. So he did. And he said, in his words, I don't want, didn't want to practice cardiac surgery in an intellectual volume, in an intellectual vacuum. I, I wanted to know the status of my patients and my heart valves. So he, he began following the patients up, every patient. And this is the first page in the book, a flow sheet. Um, the first patient died in hospital. The second patient, uh, shown here, lived for 10 years, and he died when he fell off a roof. He went back to full-time employment. And in 1974, we put in an NIH grant to computerize these log books, flow sheet books, which by that time had numbered about 3,000 patients into a computer so we could do long-term follow-up much more easily than doing it by hand as we had been doing. And uh, this shows that as of 2016, when this slide was made, there were 256,000 follow-up records on about 40,000 patients in, in what we affectionately call Starbase. And at that point, they had given rise to 85 publications, including the papers at 10 years, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and Dr. Tony Fernari presented this. It hasn't been published yet, but the 50-year follow-up. Um, and here's a survival curve that actually goes out to 50 years. There's one patient alive at the end of that. And um, this was all enabled by Dr. Starr's intention of keeping track of his patients forever. He was awarded the Lasker Award in 2007, co-awarded with Carpentier. Uh, the Lasker Award, if you're not familiar with it, is called, is it, the highest medical award in the USA. It's given to, uh, it's called America's Nobel Prize. And it's been given to 72 scientists who actually went on to receive the Nobel Prize. So Dr. Starr and I are, are still waiting for his next prize. And the, um, one of the points that the Lasker committee made is in the bottom bullet point here, that he set up an infrastructure for conducting long-term patient tracking. Not only did he co-invent and implant the valve, but he followed the patients. And that was one of the conditions that they thought was important in honoring in that. Now the OPC, how did we go from there to the OPC? Well, once we knew very well how the caged ball valve was performing, we wanted to know how it compared to the other valves that had been in, that are in use currently. 
at that time. And so we did a massive literature review and made another database that contained information on uh, all the relevant publications we could find. Um, and we, 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 we published that in a current problems in cardiology monograph. And our co-author on that was Sabu Ramdula, who's a cardiologist with us in Portland before he went down to USC and became chief. So we extracted data from all these publications about their embolism, bleeding, thrombosis, leak, and infection rates, and also their structural valve deterioration performance. Now that can't be summarized in a simple rate in terms of events per 100 patient years or percent per year, because the failure, the hazard function for structural valve deterioration is not, con is not constant. So that complication does not enter into the OPC field. There are other more sophisticated statistical methods for, I think, producing an OPC-like value for structural valve deterioration, but that'll be a conversation for a different time. So all of these, uh, all the information we collected comprised uh, 81 publications, 59,000 valves, 224,000 valve years. And this rather large monograph has 38 figures and 12 tables. Why does it have so many figures? Well, we have a figure in there comparing across the different valve types, every complication for each position aortic and mitral, and each type of valve, mechanical or biological. And you can see from this that there's quite a bit of variation. All of the, all of the slides, all of the figures for the various complications look about like this. There's a range within a certain, each valve model has a range of values, uh, but they rather s cluster around a centralized value um, why that range is uh, could be due to many things. Probably one of the most important is follow-up completeness. And as I mentioned, what, what's been called a linearized event rate is the number of events for a complication divided by the number of patient years. And the units of that are events per 100 patient years or sometimes called percent per year, abbreviated. That's what those symbols in the previous slide, those were the values. Now, this is an important paper by Gersh in 1986, Issues Concerning the Clinical Evaluation of new heart valves. And it has a gold star because I believe it is still very pertinent and very readable today. And it has an all-star cast of co-authors. Lloyd Fisher is a statistician at University of Washington, Hartzell Schaft, Freighter, Magoon, and our friend Sabu was, always, was also on that paper. And their conclusion after thinking about these things and studying was that arbitrary criteria for initial approval of a new valve would require documentation of event rates to be less than twice the average of currently accepted values. And that last phrase is in red because that's what an OPC is. It's the average of currently accepted values. And if your new valve is less than twice as bad, then it's, it, that's one of the conditions for approval, is to be less than twice the complication rates for all of those complications. Then statistically, this requires the use of one-sided 95% confidence intervals. That's also their uh, 
recommendation, which is was accepted by the FDA and is in use today. Now, the way the OPC came about was that the HEMA, the Health Industry Manufacturers Association, those were the valve manufacturers, they convened a task force. They studied all of this. They knew the FDA was going to swing into action and do something to regulate new heart valve approvals. And they wanted it to not be a randomized study for many reasons, which I don't listing here, but I think those have probably been discussed by some of you, but rather to be a retrospective uh, study using historical controls that has a rather bad name, historical controls, but in a sense, it's good. So they advocated exactly what Gersh et al. had come up with, and they introduced the term objective performance criteria. One of the reps from St. Jude Medical actually came up with that. And that means meeting currently acceptable complication rates. Now, the FDA convened a workshop in 1993, NIH, and they proposed, they came in proposing randomized clinical trials. But for many reasons, which aren't listed here, they were talked out of it. When HEMA proposed the OPCs and the Gersh method and explained it and explained the advantages, they, the FDA left the meeting with the idea they would consider that OPC. And as a matter of fact, they did. This was the 1994 replacement heart valve guidance that FDA produced. It's a big document, 134 pages. But soon after, two of the FDA <clears throat> employees wrote a short paper summarizing the clinical aspects of the FDA document. It was only six pages. And they were aware of the current problems in cardiology monograph that we had done. And they liked using that data, but it wasn't up to date. They asked us to update it through mid-1993, which we did. Gave them that data. And then they also included data from previously submitted PMA applications, which, of course, we didn't have. But that's another source of unpublished um, heart valve performance. I should have written on here and approved, previously submitted and approved PMA applications. They included the data from that. And this... These are the OPCs themselves. One set for mechanical valves and another set which are in general slightly smaller for tissue valves. And the sample size requirement based on that hypothesis test setup that the Gersh paper recommended showed that in order to prove they picked out one OPC, not the smallest, but it's kind of an average one of 1.2% per year. And in order for a valve that's performing at that rate to, to prove that it's less statistically, that it's less than 2.4%, double the OPC, it would require 800 valve years. So that was another condition that FDA used. And... The 1.2% year wasn't the smallest. I believe it was 0.6, but it would have been unreasonable to base the number of valve years on, the, on such a low so OPC. So somewhat arbitrarily, again, there's a bit of arbitrariness in this method, but it has worked over the years pretty well. Then in 2005, the ISO adopted the FDA's OPC, and they put it into a NXR of ISO 5840, and it's the same, 
The only difference is they use the terms rigid and flexible instead of mechanical and biological or mechanical and tissue. Now, in 2010, there was an important draft guidance for heart valves from the FDA, and it just simply reiterated that the control data should use the OPCs. And they also said that control data should be collected from studies during the past five years. And they recommend the OPCs as listed in the ISO document. I don't know why they didn't recommend it as listed in their 1994 document, but they're the same, so I guess it doesn't matter. And this is a list that I found on the web of uh, valves that have been approved using the OPC approach. And there was one approved heart valve during that time that has since been taken off the market, but it turns out that that valve avoided the OPC test because it was approved as a supplement to a previous PMA. And in retrospect, that valve would not have passed the OPC test. So there's a little evidence that this seems to be working satisfactorily. And the third and most recent chapter here is the ISO update of the OPCs. The original OPC said they would update it every in three years or three to five years, and it was actually 20 years, and it wasn't FDA that updated it. Instead, ISO came to town. And it turns out that in 2000, we had updated the, our monograph, the current problems in cardiology. And again, the FDA and the, and the ISO were aware of that. This is the updated figure of the one I showed previously for thromboembolism rates in mechanical aortic valves. And you can see that, and this one has the OPC superimposed on it. And you can see that although the pattern of results looks similar to the previous, they are lower than the previous, and they are lower than the OPC, way lower than two times the OPC. So a, a stricter, lower OPC was needed. So the ISO assembled an international task force, and, it and the FDA was interested in adopting whatever the ISO came up with. So that's kind of a reverse. The first set of OPC, the FDA produced, ISO adopted, and here it's gonna go the other way. ISO is gonna do the updating work. And I show a picture here of my friend, Eric Buchart, who uh, was instrumental in getting us involved in this ISO task force. He, um, he had come to Portland. He, Eric and I had done a few papers together, and he had come to Portland a few times, and he just loved staying at the Heathman Hotel, which has kind of a British ambiance to it. And so when we had to all meet in, PD, in, in person, he brought the whole group Portland, and we met at the Heathman Hotel in this conference room. And I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that day, but you can imagine it was full of people discussing what the new updated OPC should consist of. And what, we've, what they finally fought, figured out was to use a literature review, but to update the ones that we had previously published. And that, having been done, resulted in 85 series from 56 articles. And the FDA supplied the summary of safety and effectiveness that they had on hand from approved heart valves. The, the, sum, the SSE is something that the manufacturer, when he submits a new valve for approval, sort of summarizes all of the data he has produced, the manufacturer has produced. And, presents that to the SSE. And so that added an additional 13,000 valves to this new data set to, from which to derive new OPCs. And here are the OPCs that 
came out of that. Um, so what changed were two of the original seven complications, all bleeding and all leak were deleted, leaving the top five. All the OPC values were lowered. The aortic and mitral positions were given separate OPCs. In, in the original uh, edition, the FDA didn't think there was a reason for separating the aortic and mitral positions. Even though many of us did, they were in fact lumped together for the OPCs. And a very important change was that a new valve did longer, didn't longer have to be statistically significantly lower than twice the OPC. It just had to have its average lower than twice the OPC, not statistically lower. So those confidence intervals that were shown in all those figures, that those little up and down whiskers, that didn't have to be below two times the OPC, just the the average value, the little symbol in the middle of those had to be lower. And I guess that, that seems like a compromise, but I guess it was necessary in order to make these new values workable. And, and here's a paper that we all wrote, the, some of the members of the committee wrote, and, and you notice our friend Eric is here, uh, that uh, describes the new OPC and the reasons for them. And, and before I conclude, I just want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Starr again for his work in starting this work, which you could say that the spinoff, the OPCs were a spinoff of work that he promoted and was involved in. This is a picture taken last week. He's 96 years old, very healthy, both physically and mentally. And I want to thank him for his, not only his work with heart valves, but his work in hiring me 50 years ago and enabling me to have a pretty successful career. Thank you, Albert. And thank you, participants. Thanks so much, uh, Gary. This is really impressive. Uh, a huge overview going back uh, to how it started till till the recent update. So, do I understand correctly that uh, what was it, 2012, 2014, is the most recent update of this OPC discussion? Yes, as far as I know. Um, I don't know who to ask whether there's another update in the offing or not. Maybe that that's where you guys come in, this, this organization, yeah. uh, perhaps. Um, so I know Robert Byrne can comment further from his perspective, but maybe there are some clarifying questions for now. I don't know whether there are any in the chat or people want to speak up for a clarifying question. Eva, hey, nothing on the chat so far, but I could ask, sure. uh, Gary, you mentioned a list of valves that have been approved through this method, but I wonder if you're aware of any that have not been approved, because that would be equally important. And my second question is perhaps the, is an observation first, perhaps the exact level of the limit of what is acceptable doesn't matter so much as long as it's revised, because every revision, and this is surely one of the strengths of OPCs, you may agree, is that every revision will improve the standard or lower the limits. And so it's a self-regulating method for making it harder for new devices to reach the market unless they meet improving standards with each iteration. Yes, I think that even though there are some several arbitrary uh, factions to the OPC, I think they have worked well, and I think they're better than nothing. Eric, 
Buchart used to complain that some heart valves are asking approval in Europe that have extremely weak evidence behind them. That, that's why he had such a passion for this work that you all are doing. And no, I have no idea how many heart valves have been submitted to the, S, to the FDA and turned down. Yeah. That's a good question. It's not usually data that are published, but we could learn scientifically from those as well. Uh-huh. Yes. Thank you. If there are no other, say, urgent questions for clarification, I propose we move to uh, Robert Biren, who will uh, talk further. He's a member of our core MD project. He's head of cardiovascular research at, uh, I don't know how to pronounce, Mater Hospital in Dublin. Uh, That's right. Yeah, that's reasonable. Uh, and he is um, uh, uh, Secretary of European Association for Percutaneous Cardiac Interventions, and he's also linked to the European Society of Cardiology. So I'm very happy, Robert, that you can comment further and expand the, the, the presentation uh, that was given to us already. Thanks, Evert, um, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, Gary, very uh, enjoyable uh, presentation and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak just for a few moments on some of the work we've done with coronary stents which maybe would facilitate a discussion afterwards about how suitable this methodology might be for the approval of uh, coronary stents. Just checking you can see my slides on full screen. Sure. Yeah. Great so um uh, transcatheter interventions, uh, coronary stents, balloons. Uh, this has been an iterative uh, development uh, over uh, many years, as we summarized in this uh, poster for Nature Reviews uh, some years back, but I've highlighted in red uh, what was uh, perhaps a, a seminal development, which is uh, the first angioplasty that was done uh, in an awake uh, human, which was in September uh, 1977 and done by mm -hmm. Andreas Grunzig. And then shortly afterwards, then there followed the work of uh, Puel and Sigwart on developing uh, coronary stents. And the uh, first coronary stents were implanted at two sites um, uh, in a very close uh, temporary relationship to each other at the end of March. Uh, and the start of April 1986. And uh, coronary strength, similar, we learned uh, from the work with, uh, with heart valves earlier, but again, uh, you could say that uh, coronary uh, angioplasty and coronary stents uh, started with some uh, very uh, basic tools in different times as regards uh, standards uh, required for uh, approval. And these are the famous uh, Bastel catheters from uh, Andreas Grunzig, uh, which he and his team and his assistant, uh, Maria Schlump, with whom I corresponded some years ago, and she kindly sent on these photographs of how they developed the angioplasty catheters together. Uh, at the kitchen table uh, in the evening, uh, in the evening time, and uh, these are the uh, are very similar to the catheters that were used for uh, the first uh, cases back in nineteen seventy seven. Now, since that time, the field has involved uh, very rapidly, and uh, angioplasty and coronary stents are no longer a breakthrough technology, but rather a mature technology. And there's a large number of uh, coronary devices that have become uh, available for use, a very large number indeed that have CE mark for approval, and a smaller number that have been approved uh, by the FDA for, uh, for human use. Um, clinical practice guidelines now uh, recommend drug eluting stents over bare metal stents for any PCI, irrespective of clinical presentation, lesion type, whether or not a planned non-cardiac surgery is imminent, whether or not uh, dual antiplatelet therapy duration has to be long or short, and whether or not the patient is on uh, other oral anticoagulants. And the experience that we have from clinical trials uh, shows us with, that with this mature technology, indeed, uh, the rate of failure in terms of requirement for repeat revascularization or stent thrombosis are quite uh, well defined uh, based on a systematic uh, review of the literature, which was done uh, by a task force of the ESC and EAPCI uh, some years ago. And one could certainly contend that these well-defined uh, rates of uh, failure uh, might lend themselves to using objective performance criteria uh, for approval of uh, new uh, devices going forward. Now, uh, in 
uh, Europe, you'll be aware that there are guidance documents that are available uh, to help in terms of uh, clinical investigations, the MedDev uh, uh, guidance documents. And of course, these have been superseded to some extent uh, with the um, development of the medical device regulation. But uh, with the MedDev documents, there was a single uh, device-specific uh, guidance uh, document for our coronary stents, which was uh, last formally updated in December 2008. And uh, the European Society of uh, Cardiology and the EAPCI were asked to provide recommendations for a revision of this uh, device-specific uh, uh, guidance document. And here you can see the uh, members of the group, and I was uh, very pleased uh, to be asked to join the group and help with the uh, outputs in terms of the uh, report. Uh, and an executive summary was uh, published in the European Heart Journal and the full report, which is a rather larger uh, document, uh, around 160 pages, was available as an online appendix. So I would say um, in the interest of being concise, there were three uh, key elements to this uh, task force report on coronary stents. One was a systematic review of randomized controlled trials, uh, which was uh, done led by uh, Professor Vindecker and the group in Bern. And uh, this provided uh, the basis for the information that I showed you on an earlier slide, giving us an idea of uh, what uh, type of uh, rates were seen in terms of device failure, death, and myocardial infarction. The second uh, area then was a checklist for non-clinical non uh, studies from a review of the literature and the guidance documents that were available. And the third element then was a proposal in terms of what a new uh, process for evaluation of uh, coronary uh, stent devices might look like going forward. This then is a systematic review. I already uh, showed you uh, that uh, we can see from the uh, summary of the central tendency of the data that uh, rates uh, were quite well defined for stent thrombosis revascularization, also for myocardial infarction for death. And there was a significant uh, iterative improvement with time compared with early generation DES, where you can see in green, and then bare metal stents that you can see here in red. The second element I won't go through in the interest of time, but certainly you can refer to the manuscript uh, for a summary of uh, what we reviewed and the checklist that we provided for non-clinical testing for novel devices. And then the third component uh, was an overview of what we thought a potential approval process might look like, might look like bearing in mind that what we recommended uh, it wasn't clear if there would be provision under the medical device regulation for an approval process, for example, that included conditional CE mark um, uh, approval. So uh, we divided this into pre-market and post-market uh, space. And what we suggested was uh, that because stent technology was a mature technology with uh, well-defined uh, failure rates that objective performance criteria uh, would indeed uh, be useful uh, for looking at the performance of new stents going forward, a first-in-man study with an OPC at, at 9 to 12 months uh, follow-up, and that based on this, the conditional CE mark might be given. And then following on from that, uh, there would be a, a mandate on the manufacturer to do a controlled uh, trial against uh, current standard of care, incorporating not just one-year follow-up, but also extended follow-up out to five years because of some concern about uh, late adverse events with drug eluting stent technology. And uh, uh, upon the availability and review of this data, then an unconditional uh, CE mark uh, might be granted. Uh, a follow-up report uh, was uh, requested because at the time there was quite a lot of interest in bioresorbable uh, scaffolds as a particular uh, coronary device um, and uh, this report was uh, published in 2017, uh, uh, 2018, and uh, summarized the rather uh, smaller amount of data available for scaffolds, five of which had CE mark. And uh, what was clear is that there was uh, indeed a significant increase in adverse events with these scaffolds when compared with uh, standard uh, drug eluting stents. So um, just to summarize then, and maybe uh, provide uh, some thoughts uh, for discussion. Um, 
uh, common specifications and this device specific uh, guidance that I uh, showed you might be thought to be a forerunner to common uh, specifications uh, could be an important uh, component of the regulatory process for high risk medical devices uh, under the EU medical device uh, regulation. Uh, one might say that there is indeed some unmet need uh, for an update uh, to the device specific guidance document that is available uh, for coronary stents, and perhaps this could be a common uh, specification uh, based on uh, some of the work that has already been done. Uh, drug elution stent technology, uh, one would observe that this is a mature uh, technology. There are standards, standardized endpoints, and I didn't go into those in any great details uh, in the interest of time, but they're standardized endpoints for cl clinical trials and uh, the failure rates, uh, as we said, are, are well uh, established and the development of objective performance criteria uh, for coronary stents could then uh, facilitate single arm clinical investigations for novel uh, coronary stents, perhaps uh, still coupled with a mandate to do a larger uh, trial uh, after conditional CE mark approval. So with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention, and I hope uh, that uh, provides a bridge to some further discussion around the general issues uh, surrounding OPCs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robert. Uh, very clear story, especially on the, on the coronary stents and devices, right? So I do understand that, that OPCs do have a role there, but it's currently more limited. You said free market, right? That there is this OPC uh, criterion. Yes, so actually I would say it, it hasn't really been uh, adopted uh, to any extent, uh, either in the US or in the European uh, regulatory system, but you could say that there is significant uh, potential uh, for uh, for adoption, and that was one of the reasons that we suggested it as a proposed future evaluation process, albeit coupled with a conditional CE mark, and then still a mandate for a large-scale clinical trial to be performed understand so, so we are waiting for more questions or comments but maybe gary you want to comment briefly on on this story on on a different field than the valves you mean <clears throat> opc for other devices exactly these are the, the things that, that that robert talked about yeah i'm not uh i'm not too familiar with that I've I've read a couple of papers, but I don't have a good understanding of where they're being used or where they're being contemplated to being used. Um, but it does seem like a, a worthwhile approach to evaluating medical devices. I. We haven't uh, discussed the advantages of these historical controls over RCTs. That may be another topic, but there are plenty of good reasons for using this historical approach, which that's always been a pejorative word, historical control, but in effect, it, you could substitute real world experience, maybe. Uh, that's interesting. Because when, yeah, for yeah, that, that, that is the got. current buzzword, right? In the yeah. <laughs> pharma, especially if you do, yeah. they, they don't talk about real-world data, but real-world evidence. So it's immediate. Yeah, evidence. yeah. So, uh, Eva, I can bring in a question that we've had from Josh Bridgens, who's an orthopedic surgeon. Um, advising one of the large um, European notified bodies, just reminding us that there is no such thing as a conditional CE mark system in Europe. And Robert, you're well aware of that. I think when your group produced your recommendations, you wanted to advise what we thought was ideal. But would you like to comment on whether you think this could be adapted somehow to the current European regulatory system or whether it should need legislative change to introduce this? Yes, thanks, uh, Alan, and thanks very much for, for the question or comment. And indeed, this was something that we discussed as a task force, uh, whether or not we would make a recommendation uh, using the term uh, conditional approval, because at the time that we were doing our work, 
um, the MDR hadn't yet been uh, finalized and hadn't yet been uh, published. Uh, but we thought that the general uh, framework to think about approval of devices, it, it would be reasonable to have a conditional approval based on OPC data uh, with a mandate for a follow-up clinical trial. And then we know we now know that when the MDR was published, then conditional approval uh, wasn't part of the framework uh, that was available. But as you mentioned, Alan, really, it it, uh, it could well, the process that we had uh, proposed could well be uh, adopted. Um, and uh, perhaps a CE mark uh, could be given. Uh, but as is common in the field, uh, there is a, a mandate for certain post-market uh, surveillance, which would be given with the uh, CE uh, certificate. Of course, then you have to follow it down the line and say, listen, well, what happens if the, uh, if the data from clinical trial then tells a different uh, story? Um, how does that impact the CE certificate that has uh, been uh, issued? And there's a separate uh, question also asking us what conditional CE marking is. Maybe you'd like to answer that as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I prefaced uh, the comments of the task uh, to, to uh, at the start uh, of the slide unconditional to say that was uh, something that at the time it wasn't clear if conditional CE mark would be available. So I think there isn't a term um conditional CE mark, but I'm just uh, show, telling you how the, what the task force deliberations were like at that time. But the concept is that if you have a new device that is genuinely meeting an unmet need um, and it needs to be considered when there is relatively little evidence, then one option for potentially safe introduction would be initial approval on the condition that the regulate that the manufacturer then conducts very careful post market surveillance of further studies to prove that the balance of benefit over risk is substantial and it's a safe device that's effective yes i i think uh, that's that's a good uh, comment and uh, we're aware now of the opportunities that exist in the post marketing uh, space with registry-based trials and registry-based uh, randomized trials. And uh, and certainly this would provide a good forum for uh, generation of uh, of data um, after uh, a CE certificate had been granted based perhaps on an OPC study. Yeah, I was wondering about the type of study that that, that post-market study would be. As you say, if it is a randomized trial that, that is kind of severe requirement, if it would only be a careful registry that is very similar in spirit to what Gary was talking about, I think, and had a, not historic, but prospective, um, again, in the spirit of OPC, right? Or Yeah, um, so certainly, I mean, the hybrid approach that was uh, suggested uh, by the task force, of course, it does uh, put a, a significant burden in the post-marketing uh, space uh, to do a large-scale uh, clinical trial. And the key question is the one that you've, I mean, you've, you've, you've asked it really in your question there is whether that would be a careful uh, post-market single-arm study or whether it should have um, randomization and comparison against uh, state of the art. Now, because randomized trials are so common with stents and the community, for better or for worse, has been comfortable with having randomized trials and having these as a benchmark, um, some type of uh, low burden randomized uh, trial with, say, for example, the registry based comparison against a, a device that's already on the market. I mean, it might be a component of the evaluation uh, process. Now, you could say, well, um, should you take uh, whether or not uh, this truly is a stent for an unmet need uh, into account? And should you say, well, if it's just a Me Too device, then maybe we could have an OPC, but you know, to avoid efficacy drift, maybe you should also have this randomized control trial where as if it was a novel device for an unmet need, say, particularly suited to patients with diabetes, particularly suited for, for bifurcation lesions or something like that, then uh, perhaps there might be a somewhat uh, different uh, bar because of the unmet need uh, that existed for patients for this specific type of a coronary stent. So those would have been some of the discussions we also had in the task force at that time.
ultimately, I should say, rather than having a twin track approach and saying this pathway for Me Too devices, this pathway for truly novel devices, we didn't go down that route. And you can appreciate that there might be some uh, discussion about uh, how you would truly classify the devices as fully Me Too or fully novel. Understand. Yeah, so the general issue on the, on the single arm versus randomized, that, that is something that, that's why I highlighted the 2006 paper that Gary wrote on this topic. Um, Gary, can you elaborate a bit on, on why OPCs were so successful? Uh, you, you mentioned a historical con context. Uh, it was important to do some kind of evaluation, but it may also be that you really had this uh, perspective on the mechanism related to a valve. You knew what to look for and you were just going to say count that and, and that that would be really sufficient as an approach in contrast to a full randomized trial. But you may want to comment further. Yeah, that's a good point. The, uh, the end points were well known, well described. Uh, there are even official uh, society written papers on uh, how, how to uh, define thromboembolism and bleeding and so forth. So the endpoint is very certain and easy to recognize. And there's just so much information out there, so many valves, and it's, it's a very stable pr procedure. We haven't had a surprise in a heart valve in a long, long time. Um, very, very well, well performing heart valves. And I, I, I think that the historical control is, the, the retrospective view is almost as good as the prospective view in terms of the, the data collection. Uh, I just don't think there are many surprises out there. And uh, it certainly helps speed up the advance of the, of the valves themselves and it, to, to, to have a, less than a large randomized trial to have to perform. Mm -hmm. And of course, one thing is if you, if you insisted that a new manufacturer do a randomized study of his proposed new heart valve, what control valve? Could he pick out the worst performing control valve known to man and use that? Uh, I mean, there, that's a big arbitrary uh, decision that would have to be made. So um, I think it just fit, fit itself pretty well. And the FDA agreed. They, they came in uh, recommending randomized trial, but they uh, saw the light, you might say. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Now, because yeah. what I note, noted in, in Robert's presentation was that there were also really clinical endpoints, like, like mortality over time and um, need for uh, revascularization. This MACE uh, discussion it depends on the trial, how you define the major endpoint then. But yeah, how do you look upon that from the health perspective then? Or? So going beyond the specific, like uh, infection, throm thrombosis, uh, the specific events for valves. What's your question? That uh, so, so, so the clinical endpoints like mortality were they were these also considered? Oh. Yeah, that's a good point. The mortality uh, itself is was not chosen as an event for an OPC. Uh, I, I think the clinicians didn't think that it was specific enough to the valve itself. Um, of course, the, more, the deaths that were valve-related were counted in the category in which they occurred. But I believe there, there, are, there are so many non-valve-related deaths, and it's very hard to determine sometimes if a death is valve-related Probably valve related, for sure valve related. There's kind of a spectrum there uh, that can cause clinicians to have long discussions just for one particular death. Is that in or is that out? 
whole so, qualities. Yeah. Yeah. So for th those reasons, uh, so, although there can be new unanticipated events that are not categorized, and those would be such as strut fracture with a exactly. particular valve that uh, there's no OPC for that, but um, well, the OPC for that is zero. Yeah. It should not happen. Yeah. Uh, Ellen, you yeah. may want to close this session. Well, there are a lot of comments now and questions uh, about which we should answer. Um, so starting with one from Jeanette Van Loon, um, wondering if OPCs are helpful really only for well-established technologies and devices when there is a lot of data for comparison and would they be suitable for new technologies or really new developments? Um, would you like to answer that, Gary, first? Yeah, I think the answer is no. They're not suitable uh, for something new. Yeah, we, we, they're based on a wealth of it known credible information from many different investigators in many different parts of the world. And um, yeah. without and, and that, there, there can't, I don't see how there can be an OPC. And I was interested in your comment that it's really most useful for an event rate that is more or less constant. What about early events that decline after implantation and those that accrue very late? Because one well-established field that is of interest to our consortium, where there are many devices and many studies, is orthopedic implants. But then they're interested in late complications after 10 or 20 years, um, very few in the first few years. So those are examples of very early events, very late events, and whether you think this is only useful for those rates that are constant. Would you like to comment on that? from a statistical perspective, or perhaps, Eva, do you have thoughts as well? Gary? Yeah, I, I would say that the, um, the, if the rate is increasing or decreasing the event rate over time, then the OPC approach does not work. They call the, those linearized rates, but, uh, but they could be called constant hazard rates. In other words, the consistency of that is, is built in. You, you can't have it. it they're based on an event-free exponential distribution, which uh, has a single hazard that doesn't change over time. Yeah. We, uh, I, I pointed out with, with red indication that this structural valve deterioration does not fall in there because mm -hmm. it it increases over time and we, we need a different approach, but that is something that I think that could be a contribution is to add uh, SVD to the quote OPC complication by using a, a, a varying hazard rate approach, not an exponential distribution, but in fact, a Weibull distribution. Yeah, so Weibull or Gompertz or the classical statistical yeah, that, distribution. Yeah, that fits it well. Now, that has more than one parameter. The exponential is a single parameter, and the parameter is the linearized rate. Now, we have a couple of parameters, but I believe there are ways that they could be combined in a meaningful way to give something like a mean time to failure. And that could be the single OPC for a biological heart valve. Um, uh, and that, that, that's something that I'm interested in working on. If there's an appropriate subcommittee in your group that, that is interested in working on that, maybe you, Eva, are yeah. some no, thoughts it's, on it's that. Definitely a very interesting topic. So obviously, these later events do require a really long term follow up right? if things happen after 10. 20 years even and that it, but the, the trick may be can we assuming making some assumptions maybe not a linearized rate but uh, as you say an increasing rate uh, how much follow-up time do we need to have this 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 picture uh, and that that is a topic very this whole topic in the medical decision making literature nowadays how you can extrapolate from say observed survival till till 10 years for certain drugs or whatever uh, comparisons are made how you can extrapolate to say lifetime, and that is that is a um, yeah, 
the, the longer follow up, the better, and more data, the better. That are the basic statistical principles, but also the analysis approaches. I yeah. agree with you, Gary, really uh, require more attention. And like you say, you don't know how what the time window might be for the length of observation needed to capture an increasing failure rate. So maybe every approval should be conditional. <laughs> Awaiting longer term information. Ellen, sorry. Yeah. It's all right. Every approval should certainly be followed by continuing to collect evidence throughout the life cycle. We'd all agree with that. Um, there's another question which I could ask you both from Petra Schnellenders, whom we know in the consortium, um, which is if there is any problem in using historical controls for an OPC when the results may be confounded by um, simultaneous improvements in other therapy, medical therapy, for example, at the same time. Um, we see that with stents and antiplatelet therapy um, and drugs, Robert, that you might uh, address. Gary, did you discuss that all those years ago about things like the quality of anticoagulation and trends in medical treatment over time that might have affected the validity of using different data sets for the OPCs? Yes, and that's exactly the reason that the OPCs are, are given a, a time window after which they should be revised. That's exactly the reason. And how long Perhaps would you think that should be? Well, the original, I believe the FDA said something between three to five years. But the devices are getting better. The medical management get, is getting better. And it's, it's, it's true that we, uh, they, they should need to be revised so that they're based on more current data than going all the way back through time there has to be a yeah that, that's a good point and uh, also depends on the quality of the data that are collected about these devices to allow that to be revised of course as well yeah, yeah um, the completeness of follow-up also i think is a big reason why there's such a variability one of the reasons there's variability with the same device among different institutions yeah Robert, do you have a comment about this from the stent uh, group that you were part of? Uh, well, well, only to say briefly, you could see just in the brief amount of data that I did show that uh, you could see evidence of this uh, issue. So if you looked at the drug eluting stents, the first generation devices had a notably higher failure rate in terms of revascularization and stent thrombosis than the second mm -hmm. generation devices. You know, so I think something around five you know, five to seven, five to eight years might work well. I mean, drug eluting stents now, since then, seem to have reached somewhat of a plateau, whereas the new devices that came along um, after 2010, 2011, um, you know, the newer generation devices, I don't think we've yet seen a leap to uh, to a significant improvement in outcomes with those rather uh, a plateau. Now, there may be some subtle uh, um, improvement in, in rates, so which would make the undertaking nevertheless worthwhile, but it's not something we probably need to go doing every three years, for example. And there's a, a final comment on um, approval subject to um, conditions on certificates and an agreed post-market clinical follow-up plan, <laughs> which we are aware of and which I can say is the subject of inquiry of another group of colleagues within our consortium. So hopefully we'll return to that once we have more data. Um, but uh, Eva, those are the uh, questions that we've had. Yeah. I'll hand back have, to you. We do have uh, approximately five minutes left, right, for the session. Yes. Yeah, no, so we got, there's, there's the topic of, um, as you, you mentioned, variation of heterogeneity, Gary, and I, I was interested in that perspective, whether there's any discussion on that, that for, say, particular patients, one type of device might be more suited than for other types of patients. Um, so the classical subgroup thinking, and if you have these well-defined events, if a patient is, a, is relatively high risk for, say, uh, embolism, if you believe that, then it might be a better candidate for another type of valve than, say, the general advice. Is there any of this thinking in this area, or is it just uh, approved and then the indication can be any patient. Yeah, I don't think that is considered in the approval, but it's certainly considered by the implanting physician. Mm 
uh, and the and the other physicians that are taking care of the patient, which type of valve would be appropriate for that patient? The big dividing line, of course, is between the mechanical valves and the biological valves. Uh, there's a kind of an age break off in general that older patients should have the tissue valve, the younger patient, but but where the cut point is is debatable it, because the biological age of a patient and the uh, is, is not always uh, indicative of the condition they're in and, and so forth. So yeah, that's left to the individual implanting physician and um, not generally part of the regulatory statements, regulatory decisions. If I, I can come back with a question for Robert, if you like, which is that we have seen the OPCs that Gary and others produced very well established and um, endorsed by the International Standardization Organization standards for heart valves. But now we have very many new percutaneous valve devices that seem to be um, approved on a completely different set of standards um, without the same requirement for sample size, which Gary mentioned, and with different expectations, perhaps, of risks and timescale for follow-up. So, Robert, I wonder if you'd like to comment on whether we should be using the OPCs and the surgical standards for implanted heart valves more for comparison when we're looking at new percutaneous valve devices, or how you see this developing for us to develop ultimately similar and well validated standards for the new interventions? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting uh, question, Alan, and it would certainly be interesting to hear uh, Gary's perspective on this as well. But if you think about something, I suppose, like transcatheter aortic valve replacement or implantation, that's now a technology that's also um, very mature and uh, and well established. And um, I don't know if something like uh, OPCs uh, would have been a way to go for that uh, type of uh, new device when it came uh, to be available in the clinical uh, space. But obviously, it's it's a completely different type of implantation procedure compared with surgical implantation. And I suppose the community went down the route of doing randomized uh, trials um, comparing outcomes against surgical um, intervention. And that probably, I mean, probably was a, an appropriate way to go, I suppose. Um, then there's other transcatheter um, interventions that are available, for example, for uh, edge-to-edge repair and um, and replacement in the in the uh, mitral and tricuspid uh, spaces, uh, which are undergoing more early stage uh, evaluation. But I suppose, as Gary would say in his presentation, and as you allude to in your question, because there isn't a critical mass of data yet with these interventions um, in the in the tricuspid or mitral space, certainly for valve replacement, then you're not going to have a body of data that you can use at this stage for uh, for for OPCs. So I suppose uh, well-designed de um, single-arm uh, studies with from trials that have good uh, oversight and governance and follow-up and adjudication of endpoints, I suppose, is the way to go to to somehow generate a body of evidence that you can then use for for OPCs. I mean, I would say just on one point. I mean, any of these approval processes, um, it's. Uh, I mean despite the the amount of rigor that you have i mean still you know mistakes can be made and i know if we look at the scaffolds uh, area from the coronary uh, implant uh, point of view it provides a good case in point where the ce uh, criteria for approval for scaffolds came back in january 2011 based on relatively modest amount of data and uh, and devices became available for use. And then the FDA uh, mandated a clinical trial be performed, a large scale clinical trial, which uh, was performed and published in 2015. And then the devices became available in the US and then the community realized, well, these devices are associated with an unacceptable uh, uh, event, a failure event rate. And uh, the devices then were withdrawn from, from clinical practice. So I suppose, uh, you know, there's sometimes, despite very seemingly robust uh, processes, um, you can still have uh, approval issues with novel devices. 
Thanks, Robert. In the interest of time, we, I think we give the final comment to Gary. He wants to add something here. Um, that's a very good point. The idea of OPCs for transcatheter heart valves. I I did quite a few literature searches, uh, sort of in, in preparing this talk, and saw several papers with the title of OPC and transcatheter all in the same title. But I did not. Uh, obtain those papers or read them uh, because I didn't think that was part of this presentation, but it's certainly the future, uh, something to be considered. Yeah. I think that's a very positive end of this session. Ellen, do you want to add a few comments? No? So thanks, uh, Gary. So thanks very much. It was really interesting. I really learned a lot. I right? also how to frame uh, this objective rather than historical control. with one of the eye openers to me. Uh, Robert, also thanks for your elaboration on the coronary stents and devices. I thanks all for their attention. Many are online. Uh, we are over 50 participants left still at this, this time. So, um, and there is probably a next session scheduled. Maybe you want to advertise that briefly. Uh, we will do that online um, after the project board meeting for the consortium. Okay, thanks so much. So we close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.